most people aren't going to probably believe this, but every single spider-based power meter that you can buy on the commercial market new today, it's just a quirk design. And what I mean is, if you actually look at the string gauge setup, it is actually indicative of the patent of 2006 by Quark. SRM as a brand, I'm not sure if they invented the power meter, but in terms of commercialization, they were certainly the first to make a power meter, sell it commercially, and get people figuring out how to train with power. And that historic importance can't be underestimated. The original design of the SRM, you can see in uh, lots of pictures around the web, is actually a arm that is decoupled from the chain and essentially pulls on a little linkage between the two. This primitive proof of concept was fine to test in a lab, but obviously they had to move to something more robust. And when they did that, what they ended up with is putting some string gauges on a few arms that went out to a ring and they measured the strain and that worked. But why did it work? Well, the basic concept is that if you have a beam and you apply a load, you get this moment. And how much strain you get is related to that moment. So you get this drop off. So you put a strain gauge back there and you get a reading. If you have one, two, three, four arms, then you sum them all up. You can do that analog or digitally, and at the time it was only analog, really. Then you could measure the twist, and that was the theory. Unfortunately, that theory is flawed. The bending beam isn't really a perfect representation of this. What we really need to do is move to what's called a contraflexor beam. In the bending beam, we only have a force and the tip can kind of swing down. But in contraflexor beam, that happens, but then we kind of twist it back. And what that results in is the shear that would be representative of what's happening with shear gauges is constant. The moment doesn't affect that. But on the regular bending beam, we have this moment that constantly goes down. So if you're doing a bending arrangement on these surfaces, your position impacts that tremendously. But let's look what happens on the contraflexor beam. We have a negative moment, because it's twisting this way, and a force pushing down this way, which causes a positive moment. And that negative moment and the positive moment, we sum them up and look, it's now crossing in the center. So if you put a gauge in the center, perfectly, if you have an infinitesimally small gauge, it doesn't read anything. If you put a gauge back here, it reads that you're bending in one direction. If you put a gauge out here, it reads that you're bending in the other direction. So it becomes kind of twice as sensitive, like the magnitude of that slope is the same, but it, it desenses it. And if you are kind of near the center and one gauge is a little further ahead and another is a little further back, you're in this range where a lot of weird things can start happening. And this is why the earlier generations, PM, zero, we'll call it, through PM6, if you did a hanging weight test with the left arm or the right arm and in different orientations if you um, for positive and negative, you'd actually get very different results. SRM, owning that market, they've invented the power meter, they have worked with people to come up with training theory, they are at the forefront of power meter technology, and it wasn't until 2006 that based on the cost prompt that Jim Meyer from Quark went and started building his own during, I believe, his master's. And he, he knew that the spider theory was open now. The SRM patent, I believe, had expired. And he went about creating his own design. But they did something clever. They knew that the shear was constant and they knew that if you have a beam and you're applying a force to it, how much your offset causes twist. So what they did is they milled in the sides until they got this little circle. And yes, that's going to add some nonlinearity through this region, but it's bigger than the strain gauges. 
and they created a little th tiny, tiny web. They created this tiny web in between, and that meant if you twisted it along the axis, you're trying to bend this way, but if you twist out of plane, it didn't really affect it, which is super clever. It was an amazingly clever idea. So they went and they wrote their patent very generically. Essentially, they say, starting in 2006, so they've got another like seven years on this, any strain gauge substantially parallel to the chain rings. Any strain gauge, it, the primary claim. I'm going to quickly go through the original quark patent. Most of this text here on the side is actually kind of background and secondary to what the actual claims are. The claims are what would be prosecuted. This is by no means considered legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I've just looked at a lot of patents. So this up here, primarily preamble. It explains that it's just a torque measuring device and it's describing what a, effectively the minimum of what a bicycle and a, uh, crank set is and, and that's necessary because it limits the scope to a bicycle but the device comprising gets to the invention so the first is going to talk about essentially it's a spider that connects the arm to the chain ring okay doesn't actually describe how it is or how it's connected so it can be any of those things the spider including a polar pol plurality of sensors configured to respond to force applied to the spider to the at least one chain ring and produce an electronic signal relative to the force transmitted by the spider. All of the plurality of sensors oriented to be generally parallel to the plane of the at least one uh, chain ring. So that means it could be a strain gauge, could be any type of sensor, it, but that sensor must be oriented parallel to the chain ring. That is the fanciest and most all-encompassing way of saying shear gauge. Any shear gauge in any displacement in any orientation is generally going to be parallel to, to that. Um, and it can be any type of strain gauge. It can be other types of sensors too. Um, once you get into weird different sensors, it's weird to try and um, figure out what is parallel because it's generally parallel uh, the only other thing it contains is an electronic circuit configured to receive electronic signal and generate an output representative of the load on the spider parallel to the plane of at least one chain ring so this means if i was pushing on the chain ring laterally and i have a bend instead of a shear gauge that may be outside of this patent but any orientation of shear gauge would be generating an output representative of the load on the spider that's parallel or torque. So substantially parallel. That encompasses any type of shear arrangement. So the 90s are, are trucking along. Quark comes along in 2006 and they have this mechanically vastly superior design, vastly. Variances of placement, variances of gauge response, variances of angle, all would throw off the SRM. And at that time, they were just kind of getting out of the instrument some arms, which essentially meant that there were places when other arms took more load that they couldn't see and was not evenly distributed. Up until PM6, this is the design that SRM used. Quark comes up with this idea of using shear gauges in place of a bending arrangement because Shear is constant. By 2010, they were on to their second revision almost of a commercial meter. So they had the Cinco and then they had the Cinco Saturn. And a little bit after this, they start releasing their Riken and Elsa, but they're not there yet. However, they've been actively selling many units using the shear bridge in a pocket that is very well patented. So, SRM has more than likely seen this, and in 2010, they launched their PM7 design. Guess what is on this? It is a shear gauge. Now, 
In theory, they may have been able to come up with this independently. They could have been experimenting with gauges, and I can't underestimate that as a possibility. But the reality is, is Quark has a patent on using any gauge that is substantially parallel, and a shear gauge is that, and their original design in 2006 used a shear gauge in a pocket. So they've now got this single shear gauge on this arm, and Unlike Quark, who milled it down into a pocket, it means that if I'm measuring shear here and here on a beam that's bending into this camera, or now sideways, if my chain rings are offset a little bit and it twists, it's going to constantly have that little twist at that point where it goes up over the top, causing it to read high or low. Because all of these things don't happen independent. They happen with other forces. Quark saw it coming. They milled a pocket, which caused it to increase the amount of shear they saw. Then it's near the neutral axis between that armature, which meant it, it reduced twisting effects. It, it hasn't changed significantly, but on some of their earlier models, they only put that shear gauge on the one side. When they obviously saw this problem, they put another shear gauge on the other side. And some of their models, even today, I've seen it's kind of inconsistent so that when it causes that twist, it deletes it. But now you're dealing with multiple gauge installations. So in theory, it's an aped version of a Quark design where Quark came up with all of that idea of using shear gauges and placement, and they've had to come behind and kind of like cobble something together. But going back, the primary claim of Quark's currently valid patent essentially describes this. Okay, so that handles pretty much SRM. Slightly after they evolved, Power to Max comes out. Power to Max did something really clever. Um, they backwards engineered a shear gauge. So they started with a concept called a proving ring. And if you have a ring and you apply force on one side and stop it on the other, it deforms in, in this oval shape. And early methods of measuring force involved that so that they would measure the deflection. So it acted as kind of a spring, but allowed you to easily measure that deflection. So what they did was, well, what we want to do is we want to measure that twist and twist is shear. So if we took one of those and put it on a 45 degree angle, we should be able to measure the twist. So they have this outer ring that twists, this one that stationary or vice versa technically. Um, and they put this proving ring on a 45 degree angle with one strain gauge on a little tiny thin beam. So, so it acted to magnify that little beam. It didn't matter how th thick or thin that was, the thinner, the higher the strain they would get. So they could just make a really thin little sliver. But when you look at it, that's, that's awfully close to what a quark is. Quark has two shear gauges. These guys just kind of cut out little windows that you could see all the way through. So it wasn't actually different. It's back theory was completely different with proving rings and stuff. But the, once it was implemented, it just looked like a shear gauge. And because they only had one, it wasn't thermally passively compensated. So they had all these thermal issues that they had to resolve. Power to max ditched half of the strain gauges, half the installation effort, and put two strain gauges. They put, uh, they made this, this one piece ring with two pockets. Where did we see that before? Quark. What did they do? They got rid of the proving ring design and just put in two shear gauges. And that means this is just a quark with less arms. But because there's so few arms, when you pull on this, it actually pulls both sides. So you actually get weird, sporadic, dynamic error issues related to this design. So when you have your NG Eco in different orientations, it's going to do different things because when you're pull the chain is pulling on this, it's pulling here, but it's not just held by this gauge, it's held by this gauge. When you have these guys, you have two or th three axial beams that are super tough in compression. 
With NG Eco, in certain orientations, you don't have that. So you get these weird pulsations, and this is why you can't just statically calibrate these. They talk about their dynamic calibration. Well, their dynamic calibration is a necessary fact for the problems that they designed in. So they're trading off gauge installation, more complicated machining, against the dynamic calibration rig and touting it as more advanced. The reality is you can get away with good quality static calibration at multi-point intervals on all of these. When it's on your bike, your reference frame is rotating with them. The forces are changing, the angles are changing, where they're coming off are changing for spiders. But with this, that affects it. With these, these less so, significantly less so. So you essentially have double the gauge installation for no good reason against a quark that happened after the quark design. You have half the gauges in the same mechanical pockets, but you ditched half the arms causing a dynamics problem. So everything is actually now in the market derived from quark. I wanted to talk a little bit about how Quark is actually ahead of everyone. And so what we have right now is SRM is still passively temperature compensated in their spiders. They don't have active there. Uh, power to max and Quark both have them. Okay, so that kind of puts them on an even footing. Except for the mounting attachment system, this new, uh, the new implemented eight bolt system on the D0, you actually see this, these cutouts but they don't actually take the load. The, there's actually kind of a gap between them. The bolts actually take the load. And because they're tapered, they kind of take the load much more evenly. So you tighten them down and they're compressive in a dimension perpendicular to the gauges. So they tend not to affect these arms and the strain gauges. Whereas depending on how the things are toleranced and, and how you, you tighten bolts in previous generations of, of spiders, that would affect your zero. And if you don't tighten them correctly or high enough or in the correct order, uh, it would cause zero offset shifts. The second place you get zero offset shifts is in the chain rings, especially if you have uneven wear. So they'll kind of tension and ratchet up and they'll slide a little bit. And I've seen this on all, all the spiders. So if you get worn chain rings or they're incorrectly tightened, then uh, you tend to get a zero offset shift when you move from one chain ring to the other. And sometimes when you move from one to the other, you'll get a little bit. And then if you sprint, you'll get even more. Um, I've seen, honestly, much people won't like me to say it. I've seen this mainly on SRMs. With the Quark, um, they actually just launched the Quark Axis. And I'm not a big fan of this on a personal level. Um, but if we can find one here, you'll actually see that the chain rings, both of these chain rings are mechanically linked to this. There is no attachment point. They're one piece. So your zero offsets can never shift. So you have this huge reduction in zero offset problems with these bolts. You have a one piece unit, so there's no zero offsets. They've made this thing idiot proof, disposable but idiot proof. So, I mean, they're way ahead of everyone there. With that, thanks.